before I start talking about what you clicked the video for. I would like to tell you about something related to it and what I would have preferred to have been adapted into a movie or two instead. Batman Child of Dreams is a flipped manga that I have covered twice here on my channel, written and drawn by Kia Asamiya back in the early 2000s. It was written as a mystery Batman was expected to solve, while Gotham was being visited by a Japanese news crew wanting to do a news story on him. I recommend you to watch my video talking about that manga after you're done with this video, because I have a feeling that you might end up agreeing with me on Batman Child of Dreams being a superior story that should have been turned into an anime instead of this original story. Batman Ninja, or Ninja Batman, is a 2018 animated superhero film directed by Junpei Mizusaki from a screenplay written by Kazuki Nakashima for the original Japanese version. The English dub is a rewritten version written by Leo Chu and Eric S. Garcia, or so I read from Wikipedia. I won't be talking about that version, because I'm one of those anime consumers who prefer subs over dubs. As most Japanese voice actors can voice multiple different characters in separate productions without sounding like they are phoning it in. And because the Japanese version is the original, semi-unaltered version, which Junpei Mizusaki and Kazuki Nakashima made at Warner Bros. Japan. And apparently there is also a manga version written and drawn by Masato Hisa, but the only scans of it I was able to find online were in Japanese and French. Okay, and now let's start commenting about this movie's plot. It starts right in the middle or at the end of some other story, where Gorilla Grodd was chosen over Hugo trains to use Arkham inmates as test subjects on his Quake engine. Not to play video games from the late 1990s, but to do something that Batman had to arrive to stop from achieving, and that then turns this movie into an isekai. Or it would be an isekai if this was a fantasy world Batman finds himself now, but instead it is the same Goku period in the feudal Japan. AKA the movie is set somewhere between 1467 and 1615. But based on me reading the Wikipedia article of that period, Batman might be in the year 1570, and he really stands out by being dressed like this in the middle of the day. After escaping the samurais wearing Joker masks sent after him, Batman makes his way to an also time-displaced Arkham Asylum turned castle, where he is ambushed by the Joker, who introduces himself as Dairokuten Mao, the demon king of his own established Owari providence. Harley Quinn is here too, and she doesn't have the Wolverine popularity that she has today. Rather, she is portrayed as the Joker's loyal simp that the Joker does not abuse, and is as crazy and evil as he is. After Batman is overpowered because the Joker and Harley have gone native, he is forced to use the Joestar family secret technique to retreat and eventually comes across Catwoman, who gives him an exposition explanation on what is happening. The basic gist is what we pretty much already know, with Gorilla Grodd's Quake engine having been turned into a time machine, and Batman was the last one to arrive into the past at a later date than everyone else. During the two years they have all waited for Batman to arrive, Joker, Harley, Penguin, Two-Face, Poison Ivy and Destro became feudal lords in their own providences, which makes this map I got from Wikipedia completely irrelevant. With their future knowledge, they have also started the Industrial Revolution earlier than usual, likely to repower Grodd's time machine so they can return back to their own time period. While investigating this with Catwoman, they as Westerners disguise themselves as missionaries carrying a bat Bible, which along with that other bat symbol on Bruce's head defeats the entire purpose of them being disguised. And at this point, I'm going to pause summarizing the plot of this movie for a while. Basically, this movie might as well have been two movies compressed into one, or how Fate's Day Night Unlimited Blade Works was originally first adapted from a visual novel into a 90-minute movie that later was turned into a 26-episodes-long anime series. 
Essentially, both halves of this movie could have been movies, OVAs, or manga volumes that had more story in them that had to be cut because they could only make one movie and not series of movies, where the parts leading up to the last one ended up with cliffhangers. Maybe it only works with actual adaptations of existing works, like how The Long Halloween and The Dark Knight Returns were adapted as two-parter movies. Anyway, Batman finds Alfred, who also ended up in the past, with the Batmobile, which he uses to try storm the Arkham Asylum turned into a castle once again. But in the time that the Joker has spent as a daimo, he and Harley Quinn have turned the Asylum turned castle into being able to work as a Gundam that is so able to destroy the Batmobile in all the forms it transforms into, from Batplane to Batcycle, and finally into a power armor used to fight Bane who really let himself go to become a sumo wrestler not seen after this scene. Once again overpowered, Batman is rescued from the Joker by Nightwing and Red Robin, who also ended up in the past and are aligned with a ninja clan who, I assume Nightwing and Red Robin told them about him, have taken to see Batman as their fabled chosen leader. Redwood and Robin are also here, but knowing that these people are supposed to be Dick Grayson, Jason Todd, Tim Drake and Damian Wayne, Damian is the only one who comes across as written and portrayed out of character. It also does not help that he is voiced by Yuki Kaji, who leans more into his Meliodas and Koichi Hirose voice when he should be channeling Eren Jaeger and or Shoto Todoroki instead. For the reminder of the first half of the movie, Batman is contacted by Gorilla Grodd, who proposes an alliance in taking down the Joker and Harley Quinn so they can commandeer his Quake engine. But because this is the first half of the movie, once they do that, Grodd betrays them and has Two-Face firebomb the ship they are on as he literally jumps ships. And if the story was not this compressed, I guess there would be some explanation on how the hell is Batman expected to survive this. How is anyone supposed to survive from that? Oh, and Catwoman also jumped ships to stay on what she sees as the winning side. The second half has Batman and his Robins live with the Bat Clan while picking themselves up from the defeat and adapting better to the time period so they can do better in the final fight in the film's climax. While the villains are preparing for a probably historical battle at the Field of Hell, Batman finally decides to go native and embrace his role as the fabled leader of the Bat Clan that Nightwing, Red Hood, Red Robin, and Robin had told them that he is. So, for the next following month's worth of time, there is an art shift showing, as they are going native in adapting better to the time period, and they prepare to play their parts better in the climax. Did I say that already? During that, we also see Red Hood having adapted a more period-appropriate attire as a Komosu beggar monk with his straw helmet being painted red like Red Hood. And here we have a plot point that would have probably been extended better if this was a two-parter movie or an anime series instead of just one movie. After surviving Grodd and Two-Face bombing their ship, the Joker and Harley have also gone native as seemingly amnestic farmer couple that the Red Hood tracks down and beats up because of the history he has with the Joker. No. No. Shot to the face. No. Batman follows Red Hood and stops him from killing the two, as the amnestic Joker explains their predicament with Batman believing it, but after he and Red Hood leave, Joker and Harley regain their memories in foreshadowing that they are going to be back later. Then the climax happening a month later is a huge whiplash of genre switching, as the villains take part in that probably historical battle where their castles are not only moving like holes moving castle, but they are also capable of transforming into Gundams that Grodd then via his mind control powers is able to make them combine into a one big giant mecha. 
And uh, while this has been happening, Batman and his Robins have been making their way to the battlefield with the Bat Clan, and then the Joker and Harley Quinn show up back as their usual selves to commandeer the giant mecha with knockout gas they were farming in their amnestic state, which they then use to overpower Grodd and throw him out of the mecha along with Catwoman. Hyvä päivä, and wait, there's more! This music is just comes out of gold. After Batman and his Robins save Grodd and Catwoman from falling to their deaths, the Joker and Harley decide to have a nap in the middle of the climax, so Grodd can give Batman and his Robins a flute to control monkeys. And at this point, it becomes necessary to stop taking this movie seriously, because I'm not sure if this could even make sense if the story was spread into a longer format than this compressed runtime. First, they used a flute to summon monkeys, which combined with the bats controlled by the Bat Clan, then unite to create a gigantic hive, which takes the form of the original Bob Kane Bill Finger Batman that will go into public domain. 2035. That takes Batman, Catwoman and the Robins into its fist and punches them inside the mecha, which leads to one-on-one -on -one fights which are mostly poor matches. They are clearly decided via color coding, but instead they should have made Nightwing go against Deathstroke because of their shared history, Red Hood against Two-Face because he killed Jason's father, and with Penguin and Poison Ivy it can be random choice between Robin and Red Robin. That one vs Harley is done pretty quickly, but we all know it is the Batman vs Joker fight that gets most of the attention here. Long story short, they have an over-the-top choreographed fight sequence, which shows Batman using what I think is the Shadow Clone Jutsu from Naruto, which I have never watched, so I only know it by reputation. And the fight ends with what could be probably taken as a reference to the end of the Dark Knight. <laughs> And now that Batman and his Robins have the Quake engine back in their hands, they bid farewell to the Bat Clan and use the time machine to bring everyone who got time displaced and are still alive back to the present day or to 2018 when this movie came out. The first half of the end credits is done in a creative comic book style in showing as they return to the present, leave the villains into Commissioner Gordon's and Lieutenant Harvey Bullock's custody, and then rush back into their lives they have in the present day. There is a post credit scene showing Cat One pawning a vase she managed to get from the past, aka it was stored inside Arkham as it was transported through time. And with Batman taking a horse-powered Batmobile to a party that he was supposed to attend as Bruce Wayne the night before this whole movie happened. Which might as well be like carrying a sign or a t-shirt telling everyone that Bruce Wayne is Batman. The best and nicest way to describe this movie is as wasted potential. The animation, musical score, and the vocal performances presented in the movie were serviceable to tell the story in this movie, but the story itself is the weakest link here, by being compressed this much into 85 minutes. There are so many background details that could have been given much more attention if this was a multi-episode anime series instead. It is doubtful that it would get a similar treatment as Fate's Day Night Unlimited Blade Works was given after its initial adaptation as a 90-minute movie before being turned into a 26 episodes long anime series. If Batman Ninja were to be given that similar treatment, then more attention would have been given to the scenes and characters to have the story make more sense. Like the two years that the villains and Batman's family spent in the Sengoku period before Batman arrived, how the villains took over and rose to power as feudal lords in their own providences, 
how Nightwing, Red Hood, Red Robin and Robin adapted to the time period and teamed up with the clan that ended up worshipping Batman as their fabled, soon to be arriving leader of their clan and that is why Damian as his son was given this royal haircut. How Alfred kept the Batmobile maintained for two years so Batman could use it when he arrives. How Catwoman has probably been a double agent playing both sides for her own survival and benefit. What happened to the staff and other patients in Arkham during those two years. And what happened to Bane after his token appearance as a sumo wrestler. Like I said, wasted potential! As for the voice cast, I found most of them pretty good choices and was also surprised when I found out what other characters they have voiced. Batman was voiced pretty well in character by Koichi Yamadera, whom I was able to later recognize also as Lord Beerus from Dragon Ball Super, but also noticed while going through his filmography that he also voiced Spike Spiegel in Cowboy Bebop. Then the Joker was voiced by Wataru Takagi, whom I later realized was doing a serviceable performance in multi-channeling Okuyasu Nijimura from Jojo's Bizarre Adventure Diamond is Unbreakable. Catwoman was voiced with a balanced performance by Aika Kuma, whom, while I was looking for if I had come across her in other roles, discovered that I had only heard her as Julius Alexia von Rispeld from At the Asterisk War. <laughs> As Harley Quinn, we had Rie Kugimia, whom shockingly enough used to voice Alphonse Elric in both the 2003 Full Metal Alchemist as well as the Two Brotherhood series. She also voiced Happy in Fairy Tale and Rise Kujikawa in Persona 4 Golden. As for the only not Batman villain, aka Gorilla Grodd, we then had Takehito Koyasu, who is already better known for his role from Jojo's Bizarre Adventure, Phantom Blood and Stardust Crusaders as and moving on with the Yoyo references, Nightwing was voiced by Daisuke Ono, aka. And I already said in the plot commentary that Damian Wayne's Robin was voiced by Yuki Kaji, who could have probably worked better if Damian was written more in character and Kaji-san had made him sound more like Eren Jaeger or Shoto Todoroki rather than Meliodas or Koichi Hirose. Batman! This is the Monkichi! This guy is good! I know you know what I'm saying. You're tired! I'm tired! I'm tired! Then in lesser roles, Red Hood was voiced by Akira Ishida, whose previous roles include Wizardmon from Digimon Adventure. And Red Robin, aka the Tim Drake version, was voiced by Ken Gokawanishi. Whom, like Hachu Otsuka, who voiced Alfred, has not been in anything that I have been watching enough, apparently. Going through the final villains, who might as well be counted as cameo roles, for Deathstroke we had Yunichi Suwabe, better known to me for having voiced Archer in Fate's Day Night and Aizawa Sensei from My Hero Academia. Oh, yeah. 
Unknown to death. Unknown to life. Unlimited. Blade works! For Poison Ivy, we had Atsuko Tanaka, better known to me for having voiced Caster in Fate Stay Night, Lisa Lisa in Jojo's Bizarre Adventure, and apparently also Bayonetta. For True Face, we had a Toshiyuku Morikawa, better known to me for having voiced Lord Boros in One Punch Man and Yoshika Kekira in Jojo's Bizarre Adventure Diamond is Unbreakable. For Penguin, we had Che, whose work I am completely unfamiliar with. And finally, in doing those grunting voices for the sumo wrestler Bane, we had Kenta Miyake! As in Scar from Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood. Muhammad Abdul from Yoyos Bizarre Adventure Stardust Crusaders. Muhammad Abdul! Yes! I am! And All Might from My Hero Academia. A hell of it, this is talk about wasted potential now. That kind of all-star cast was brought into for such an ambiguous anime project and was then sent to work on their other projects after it was compressed into a single 85 minute long watch once and don't bother watching it again type of standalone film that you can only enjoy if you're not taking it seriously. Yeah, this was definitely a Warner Bros. film project from the late 2010s, and studio executive meddling must have been a factor. Alright, and the next scheduled video project I have coming up is a review on a crowdfunded indie comics creature, which I also funded last year. After that, I'm going to fully focus on finishing the scripting process for my Near Replicant video series, and once they are written, I might also do other videos in between their publication, like more comic to adaptation comparisons. Until those come out, remember to like the video, comment what you have to say about this movie down below, share the video for more people to see, and subscribe or stay subscribed for those following videos. If I have managed to start doing gaming streams again, then you can also ding the bell for a chance to chat with me, and may your heart be your guiding key.